Hello, my name is Thomas Danner. I'm uh, the chief physician at the Diabetes Center of der Bult in Hanover, Germany, and I'm also the chairman of SWEET. It's an honor for me to speak today at Best of ISPERT, the ISPERT meeting 2022, which was held in Abu Dhabi, October 15 to 16. And I will speak on a symposium on registries. Why are they important? Now, the first talk in this symposium was given by Mark Clements uh, from uh, the Mercy's Hospital in Kansas City. And he explained the experience of type 1 diabetes exchange, how this has changed the work in his hospital and uh, within a collaborative of several centers in the United States. You know, during a four-year period, he could increase the acceptance of continuous glucose monitoring in some clinics and uh, also introduced depression screening. And what they actually did was they made kind of a score of different habits that patients had uh, so that they could identify uh, problematic behavior and address that with their uh, patients. So this was very much a clinic-based approach. The next uh, speaker here was Henk Jan Anstud. Uh, he uh, was speaking on iCloud uh, care and an e-clinic in diabetes. And he pointed out that there is a constant flow of medical data from the devices and you can actually uh, have this in the cloud and constantly monitor uh, the patient's medical condition. And they have uh, different centers, regional centers for uh, diabetes of children and adolescents. And they are using this type of cloud care to actually where the patient is uploading the data. And uh, they are then uh, through a secure uh, server putting this on the uh, gener uh, um, generator report where they can see whether a patient is doing well. So this would be a green point where a patient is not doing very well. This would be a red point. And then you have intermediate ones, which would be orange or yellow in terms of uh, how their device readouts are actually uh, looking. And so if you see that there is a trend, if you see that the targets are not met, then uh, the uh, doctor will uh, call or uh, arrange a follow-up visit to adjust the therapy based on uh, this uh, upload of the data. So this is very much the future, and we can see how cloud care will be doing. Of course, there are, it's easy to uh, establish that in one center. It's difficult to uh, um, link different centers to that. Well, then the question, of course, came up, okay, we have seen now local things. We have seen national things like in um, the Netherlands. So how about worldwide registries? And this is obviously the SWEET registry. The SWEET registry was uh, founded to, uh, with a vision that we want to have equal high quality care for children with diabetes worldwide and try to harmonize care and outcomes for children. And uh, as you can see, we have more and more uh, centers that are actually actually participating, and uh, most of them uh, are uploading uh, data quite regularly. You can again see that there is an increase, which is of course very, very nice. Uh, overall, um, I think as we are now speaking to audiences, mainly in India, uh, you can see that uh, many centers in India are actually participating, and this is of course very, very nice, and uh, I, I look forward to um, even more centers uh, from the region. There are other reasons why we have less, so please uh, kind of spread uh, the good news. And uh, of note, for example, in Indonesia, which I will be talking to in a moment, we don't have a sweet center yet. So there are more than uh, 1 million visits in this uh, registry and more than 100,000 patients. And you can see here that uh, the, the data is really increasing uh, over time, both longitudinally as well as cross-sectionally. And the good thing is it shows also that such a registry is able to reduce and improve the long-term glycemic control in all age groups. And uh, it is clearly different from what the type 1 diabetes exchange at present is doing, although they have this increase of uh, people using technology which might be a good thing. Uh, so far, they are still lacking with the proof that the glycemic control is improving. Now, um, it's not only about 
looking at improved glycemic control. I will come back to this in a moment. But of course, there are also sometimes crises where you have to look what is doing with delivery and care. And uh, there was a lot of discussion whether, for example, the number of people with uh, type 1 diabetes are increasing, particularly the children, due to um, the COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, here you can uh, see uh, data from the German DPV registry, which is a national registry. Um, and indeed, uh, they uh, could show uh, that the, um, the data of uh, the, um, uh, the, the 2020 numbers of patients uh, with diabetes are increasing uh, much more than you would expect in the normal uh, increase. So the question here is, does that mean that due to the, uh, to the COVID uh, pandemic, we have an increased number of people with type 1 diabetes? So we looked at the same thing here in the um, SWEET registry, and you can see, yes, the uh, numbers of uh, children with diabetes are increasing uh, still, and this has uh, just been published in Diabetes Care. Uh, and you can see, uh, however, that this increase is happening in all age groups, uh, uh, very, very uh, similarly, uh, but there is no jump basically in 2020 or 2021. So at least in these large uh, pediatric diabetes centers worldwide participating in SWEET, uh, there is the linear increase of the numbers uh, of uh, children with diabetes in all age groups, but it is there's no change uh, due to COVID. However, if you look uh, a little bit more closely to this, you can see here that, uh, the, how the seasonality is changing because usually we have in the uh, so-called winter months, uh, in the beginning of the year, an increase uh, in, in numbers. So uh, this would be um, the red line and the green line. However, in 2020, when there was the lockdown, uh, there was no such increase in the uh, in the early uh, months of the year, um, very likely due to the worldwide lockdown. And you can see there are actually uh, a low number of uh, uh, cases. However, then later during the year, uh, there was a much higher increase. So there was a shift in the seasonality. Now, if we look at uh, Europe and North America, you can see that the response is quite different. So while in Europe in 2021, the seasonality turned uh, back with this high uh, raise in the uh, um, in the early time of the year, and uh, then with low numbers uh, in the in the middle of the year, this was not happening yet in, in North America. And uh, so this, of course, is interesting that we don't know exactly why this is, but clearly it shows you that uh, registry data is also important and necessary to look at public health issues, for example, in relationship with the pandemic. So then finally, there was a debate uh, between myself and uh, Aman Pulungan from Indonesia. And we kind of discussed on the basis of our data uh, in registries, um, do we need to centralize uh, diabetes care. And I was arguing, yes, we do need this. And Armand said, well, uh, but there are some uh, special concerns in countries which are not doing, uh, which are not economically uh, so um, uh, with, with a very high income compared to countries like my country, Germany. And he first started and said, well, the national situation in Indonesia uh, is that we have, uh, according to their registry, 1,249 uh, children uh, with type 1 diabetes. And uh, there are uh, 43 of 47 pediatric endocrinologists are treating uh, children with diabetes. Uh, but uh, if you see that only 26 of them have more than 20 patients, you see that uh, there are only very few patients per center uh, in Indonesia. So it's, it's, it's really a very scattered uh, care that is available and not too many uh, uh, diabetes patients. So uh, I said, well, you know, uh, we do need a multidisciplinary team for treating uh, children with diabetes. And uh, uh, actually, the, we, there were recommendations from the SWEET group 
uh, on the basis uh, of calculations of the different centers that depend for 100 patients, you need a full-time uh, nurse, for example, as an optimal care, a minimal a half-time uh, nurse, a half-time doctor, and a, a third dietitian as, as the minimal care, and also uh, access for, for a social worker and a psychologist. And obviously, if you have less than 20 patients, this will be difficult to have such resources available. And uh, we actually looked into the suite centers, uh, and uh, we had uh, a questionnaire also within the, uh, the members of, the, uh, of ISPAD, um, and uh, we looked at 108 data sets, and you can see there were centers of very different size from uh, less than 100 to more than 350. And uh, kind of, it became clear that around 150 uh, patients is what you need to really uh, come close uh, to those recommendations uh, staffing structure uh, for um, uh, that would be needed for multidisciplinary care. However, it is also clear, and this is again Swede registry data, this is a bubble chart showing you the relationship of the target achievement of an A1C under 7.5, or really uh, um, a high proportion of patients with uh, an A1C above 10. Um, and so the, the bubble shows you the size of the center, and uh, you want to be in the lower right corner, because that means you have very many patients with, this, uh, with control below uh, an A1C of 7.5, and you have also very, very little number of patients uh, that are in the high uh, group of above 10. So one of the big bubbles, as you can see on the left, is actually uh, a very big center, uh, which has a lot of uh, patients in uh, glycemic control above 10% and has only few 10% uh, uh, of their patients reaching the target A1C of 7.5. On the other hand, there are several very small centers on the far right, which have the majority of their patients, more than 80% in the target range, and very, very few in, uh, the, um, in the target range. So clearly you can say, well, um, this uh, shows that not, it's not always the size of a center that matters in terms of glycemic control. However, if we analyzed this uh, earlier, and this is already old data from the VIDER group, which also looked at 22 different international centers, what is actually important for achieving the target, we already then found out that it is not the number of people working and the hours they have, it is more the uh, targets that the team is having and whether or not all team members agree on the target. You can see here on the far left, 100%, of those achieving an A1C below seven on average, uh, they actually uh, know that uh, they have a very um, ambitious target and they are the ones that are, are achieving uh, the uh, best average A1C and all the team members agree on that. And this data was kind of reproduced with the suite registry where uh, again it was shown that a lower A1C target is associated with better metabolic control and there was again no association between the composition of the diabetes team and the metabolic control. Now uh, to look into something else is how does uh, the control relate to technology and again registry data helps us to see to compare patients who are on injection only who have injection uh, and the sensor, who have only a pump and a pump in the sensor. And clearly the A1C was lower in all categories of participants who used a pump and or a sensor compared to injections. So clearly it shows that diabetes technology and in particular pumps uh, are very, very important. And the same goes uh, for uh, the DKA uh, episodes. With severe hypoglycemia, it's a little bit complex because obviously many patients of uh, high risk of severe hypoglycemia are put on technology. Uh, so the, uh, there is actually a higher rate uh, with a pump um, uh, compared, uh, pump and sensor compared to pump only. But this is of course because people with hypoglycemia are more likely to uh, get 
uh, sensor. So if we look at temper uh, over the, uh, the the whole time period, you can see that in the sweet centers, the improvement of glycemic control takes a little bit of time. The increase of technology is actually preceding the improvement of A1C. Um, and uh, again, when we see the blue um, um, areas here, they show the increase of the CGM. And uh, maybe there, there is a little bit of a plateauing with the pumps, but then uh, we expect now that the glycemic control is further improving, particularly through the effects of CGM and uh, then later on probably the automated insulin delivery. So the question is now, uh, is funding the major obstacle for diabetes technology um, adaptation? And uh, there is, of course, a lot of controversy on this. Uh, there was a big questionnaire um, in Middle East, Africa, Southeast Asia, uh, looking at uh, the reasons uh, for diabetes technology. And yes, they said in 70%, the main reason is money. Although some said, well, there are other reasons too. And I always point out, well, if we are convinced that diabetes technology is important, uh, how about uh, looking at other technology, how this has been uh, reaching uh, the general market? And uh, I always like to cite that in 2022, the number of smartphone users in the world uh, translates to 83% of the world's population. Uh, so that the total, the number of uh, people that own uh, a smart uh, and feature phone is uh, nearly 91% of the world's population. So if everyone is able to have a smartphone, why isn't it then possible that the majority of uh, people uh, who would profit and have a better long-term outcome with diabetes technology is not able to have that. And I think we, we really have to look into this uh, more further. And uh, I, again, I think registries can help us a lot. Uh, for example, when we looked in Europe at the implementation of CGM, uh, comparison between regions really puts a lot of pressure on uh, politicians as well. And you can see how from 2009 to 2018, the reimbursement for CGM has changed. And you can see that, of course, those countries in red in 2018 didn't feel too good because, yes, why, why are we still not able to uh, achieve that, to give this to the patients when so many under, other countries are able to do that? And uh, again, I can tell you, uh, in the meanwhile, many of those red countries, for example, like Portugal, have reimbursement for continuous glucose monitoring as well. So registry data helps also to make change in health policy. And overall, you can see how the numbers of CGM in uh, type 1 diabetes is increasing over time. So uh, by now, the number of patients having a CGM in the sweet registry is close to 70%. Uh, and uh, you also see uh, that the uh, number of uh, people uh, who are using uh, the, um, the, the CGM overall uh, is increasing as well. So, but um, is it really only about money? And here is Germany, uh, my country, and you can see the uh, how the money is distributed. We have uh, uh, quite a big difference in, in Germany of some regions which are economically not as well doing as, as others. But if you look at the insulin pump use, it doesn't go along with the uh, economic area. So it is very clear that it's not only economy, but it's very likely also the expertise of uh, the doctors and also how open doctors are to prescribe uh, diabetes technology and probably their own knowledge about diabetes technology, which plays a big role whether they use it or not. And uh, so actually the JDRF uh, did a big uh, um, questionnaire asking, uh, so what were the barriers uh, to use an insulin pump? And uh, they found out that actually the major barrier was that the clinician nurse has not recommended such a pump to them. So we have to make clear that it's not only the economic issues uh, for a pump and with pumps becoming less and less uh, expensive and the same goes for sensors, uh, I think uh, we, we can push forward that more people have access to diabetes technology. 
So uh, to kind of uh, come to a close uh, of uh, our, our discussion, so Amal and myself uh, uh, said, well, uh, registries are not solving all the problems, but they are delivering data so that we can look much more into how, uh, how to drive change uh, for people with diabetes. So registries are very, very important to improve care, improve outcomes and shape uh, healthcare policies, and uh, uh, I hope uh, this uh, session registries why are they important have supported that. And uh, so, if you are a sweet member, I hope to see you in April 20 to 21st in Paris, uh, in in France at the next uh, uh, sweet meeting. And uh, if you are an ISPAT member, then of course I uh, want to hope to see you at the meeting in Rotterdam. Uh, and if not, then of course, we will virtually present you the highlights of ISPAD again uh, on this channel. Thank you very much for your attention.